Amen. Okay. So we are um, on part six of a group of messages about social media and the two witnesses. I think I got like two more to go. We're going to start talking about authority today, um, kind of working our way into, okay, what does this look like in the authority of the Bible to be a witness in an age where there is social media? Okay, and so I'm going to start, uh, I'm just going to try and get through the first part of the notes. If you've been paying attention to the notes at all, and if you don't have the notes, Lonnie's got them in his hand. Uh, I've had this list, if you look down on page one of the notes, this list that starts with highlighted witness verses in every set of notes since the first week. So I've never gotten to this part, and I was talking to the Lord about that. And he's like, well, you just weren't ready. So to, I think today we're ready. So the first part of the notes is in blue. That just means... This is where we left off last time we were together, and I want to make sure I went through this super fast. So only witnesses will live in heaven. Only witnesses that witness the glory of who Jesus is to each other will live in heaven. The, the, the reason is this is the way heaven is. That's what you see when you look in Revelation 4 and you see the seraphim, and they're crying out, holy, holy, holy. They're actually laying out doctrine of the holiness of God. When it says they say holy, say means a lot more than they talk. They're actually teaching of the holiness of God. The, the elders are responding, and they are actually declaring the worth, like they're revealing the worth of who God is. And all of heaven worships in this revelatory environment of witnessing. That's the point of coming into a relationship with God through the Holy Spirit is the Spirit bears witness. That's what the Spirit does. He bears witness to you of the things Jesus has already said and more as you can bear it. And then we're supposed to actually, according to 1 Corinthians 12 through 15, we're supposed to use the power of the Spirit's communication with us to bear witness to other people. That's really what 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14, and 15 are talking about, all in the sphere of love, which is what 1 Corinthians 13 is talking about. And I've, we talk about this reality all the time, so I'm, I'm kind of going through it fast because I know you already know what I'm saying. Okay, so to obtain resurrection... You actually have to become a public witness to truth in the body of Christ and a public spectacle of coming out of the world to the world. There's two different places you're witnessing to. You're witnessing to the church and you're witnessing to the world. And the Bible is clear on this. We've been developing this for several weeks. So the on, this only happens by a miracle. It would take a miracle for you to be a faithful witness like Jesus is a faithful witness because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. So if you want to be a true witness, you need the Holy Spirit to be informing your speech, where you do it, and how you do it, okay? Now, if you signed up to follow Jesus, you signed up for persecution and reviling from religious people for bearing this witness. That's true over and over and over in the Bible. Religious people are the ones who killed the prophets. Religious people are the ones who persecuted the apostles. Now they co-opt the government often. That's a pattern that we see in the Bible. We talked about that last time, August 16th, when we were talking. That's what we were laying out was Jesus laid out this doctrine of it starts with religious people, but it always goes to the government. So there's lots of examples of this. I'm just thinking of Paul before Felix and like people come. It's all kind of cor corrupted. The government actually kind of wants to let Paul go, but it's religious people that stir up the trouble always over and over in the Bible. Okay, so if you signed up for, to follow Jesus, you signed up for that. Okay, and then there's this passage, uh, John 15, 27. Uh, you also will bear witness because you've been with me from the beginning. And then the very next verse, John 16, 1 to 2, these things I've spoken to you. He's telling them that the world will hate them. And that's the context of this. That you should not be made to stumble. You need to understand as a follower of Jesus that you must bear witness. That will elicit hate from the world and from religious people, and Jesus tells us this so we don't stumble. There's a time of falling away that was the church has always been looking for, this falling away where people would no longer endure sound doctrine. Okay, And he says, they will put you out of synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think he offers God service. This is, this is not godless people trying to kill godly people. This is mistaken godly people that don't know the Father, that want to kill those who do know the Father because they're saying something that is hard, 
difficult in drawing people into the same reality of standing as a witness of who Jesus actually is. Now, the witness of who Jesus is is not the sandwich board guy in the park yelling at people to turn or burn. That's not the witness of who Jesus is. You will not find Jesus doing that. The witness of Jesus is forgiving enemies, loving those who hate you, praying for those who spitefully curse you. Right now, the church is not a very good witness of Jesus, just so you know. There are pockets that are. We are not great witnesses of Jesus. We need to be. It needs to start in our family. When we have a family disagreement about what Jesus is doing or what Jesus is saying, we actually have to bless each other, love each other, forgive each other, pray for each other. You know, it's like this starts from the inside out. But we mostly see a lot of kind of pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness right now, especially on social media, which is kind of the point of these messages. So those who endure this time as witnesses, they'll be resurrected in the first resurrection. No one else, hear what I'm saying. This is the main point of what I want to say today. No one else will be resurrected in the first resurrection except for those who are witnesses, public witnesses that get hated by religious people and thus by co-opted governments. You will not be resurrected in the first resurrection if you are not a martyr or a witness. They mean the same thing. Martyr and witness mean the same thing. Revelation 20, 4 to 6. And I saw thrones and they sat on them. And judgment was committed to them. Now, I'm talking about witnesses of Jesus' heart and his truth. Not just people who take Bible verses and then bash people over the head apart from Jesus' heart. That's not a witness of Jesus. That's an angry religious person. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God and who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So the souls of those who have been beheaded for their witness to Jesus. This is describing martyrs, martyrios. Over the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. So witness, or martyria, G3141, or martis, G3144, it's a legal witness to the corruption in the church, justice, and religious systems. That's what that word means. It means a, a witness of the corruption in the church, the justice in the earth, and the religious systems of the earth. That's what witnesses are. It's not just a general kind of, hey, I believe in Jesus. It's a clarity with this is what it means to follow this man, and it's becoming corrupted. So if you look in the New Testament, you'll see epistles by the the early believers, and that's mostly what they're writing about is there are false gospels already they, they would tell people, look, you can't turn from this grace into the law. There's all kinds of falsifications of the gospel, licentiousness, the, the Nicolaitans that just threw off all restraint. This is what witnesses are. Witnesses are speaking to the church and about injustice in the world for downtrodden people, okay? Clearly in the Bible. So G3144, a witness in a legal sense, in a historical sense, one who is a spectator of anything, e.g. of a contest in an ethical sense. Those who, after his example, have proved the strength and genuineness of their faith in Christ by undergoing a violent death. Now, you don't have to wait for your body to die. What Jesus actually invites us into is to die to ourselves first. If you die to yourself, you don't need the physical death in the same way to teach you something. You actually want it. You want to lay down your life right now. That's what he said. If you try to save your life, you're going to lose it. If you're willing to lose your life, you're going to save it. That's what he's trying to say to the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler is like, I obeyed all the commandments. He said, there's one thing you're lacking. There's one thing you really love that you don't want to lay down, your money. Sell it all. Give it away to the poor. Come and follow me. Jesus wants us to lay down our lives. Guaranteed that everybody's going to lay down their lives. The manner in which you get rewarded for laying down your life is entirely commensurate with the way you follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. It's appointed once for man to die then the judgment. You want your death to be judged well. Well, if you're afraid of death, chances are you're not going to be judged well. You're going to make all kinds of choices to try and avoid your death. If you're embracing this message of the cross, this is what, this, this is what the cross means. If you embrace your own death, chances are you're going to die before you die. And then when they try to kill you, you're going to get glorified. That's what happened to Stephen. Stephen was already dead when they killed Stephen. He was already dead to his own life. 
He was already living as a witness to who Jesus was. So when they killed him, he's like, I see heaven open. And he starts praying for the people who are trying to kill him. Do you see what I'm saying? You want to do that dying right now. That's the point of all these messages. Primarily geared at being a witness in the greatest platform earth has ever seen to be clear about who Jesus is. Now, I'm not saying sharing memes that say, share this with everybody you know, pray this prayer, God's going to bless you. That's not a witness of Christ. I'm talking about relating truth of his heart and the truth of his word combined together by the leadership of the Holy Spirit, right? Get what I'm saying? Okay, so E, witness. I just read the definition. Now, I want you to look at these passages. We're going to go through them super fast because I really don't want to spend much time on this. Every time you see the word witness, you're going to see witnesses to these areas, to the church, areas of justice, and to the religious system. Okay, so Mar Matthew 18, 16. All I did was type in the word, search for that word, G3144, or 3144, or 3141. And I just gave you the list of all these passages. And it's, this is not exhaustive. There's more than this. I just, these are the ones I had space for, and I didn't want to have seven pages of notes. I tried to keep it to six so that they're three pages double-sided. Okay, so, but if he will not hear thee, take with thee, th with thee one or two more that in the mouth of two or three, everybody say, witnesses. Now, these witnesses, what are they witnessing? They're witnessing to another brother his sin. See what I'm saying? So this is a witness to the church is the point of what I'm saying. Then the high priest rents his clothes and saith, what need we any further witnesses? Who were these witnesses he was talking about? They were witnesses against Jesus, against Christ. Very good. Luke 24, 48. And ye are witnesses of these things. Speaking to the disciples, what are they witnesses of? Jesus' resurrection. They're witnesses of the church. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses of unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Witnesses of Jesus. Witnesses of this resurrection. The beginning from the baptisms of John unto the same day he was taken up from us must be uh, one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. They are looking for a witness of somebody who knew Christ from the very beginning to replace Judas, who was a bad witness. Okay, this Jesus hath God raised up whereof we are all witnesses. Now, who were they witnessing to? Right here, Acts 2, do you know? They were witnessing to the religious people of, of Jerusalem in that day because the religious people in Jerusalem didn't want to hear any of this stuff. And kill, or that, they were, they were, that was in uh, Acts 2. They were talking to people that had come to the, to the outpouring of the Spirit. And killed the prince of life with whom God had raised from the dead, whereof we are all witnesses. Again, speaking to the church, telling religious people. Not just, not the church per se, but religious people. How many of you know that the church is filled with religious people that don't know Jesus? All over the place. Absolutely. Wees was them, probably, at some point in time. Okay, now, and we are witnesses of these things. So is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given them that obey him. And I, just, we could go through all of these, and you will find these are all talking about the same reality. You must be a witness to the church of what is the true gospel. This is what all of this New Testament epistles are talking about, is stirring up each other to love and good works, even more so as we see the day approaching. We're actually supposed to love the body of Christ enough to be a witness when it's got a cancer, when it's sick. You see what I'm saying? And if you don't do that, you won't then lead the body of Christ for a thousand years. There'll be, a, there'll be many people that have said yes to Jesus, have not said yes to the cross, have not said yes to being a witness. They will live on the earth for a thousand years in natural bodies being discipled by people who are kings and priests. They're kings and priests over the family of God. That's the only people that are going to live forever. You know that, right? Saved people <laughs> going to live forever. If you're king and a priest, you're king and a priest over the body, you're a leader in the body, you're a bride, you're, you're one with Christ, you're a representative in matrimony of a oneness to people that haven't quite figured that out yet. So if you do that now, you'll be a king and a priest through this thousand year reign. There will also be unbelievers that live on the earth for that thousand years. There'll be both. That's why Jesus, he says to unfaithful witnesses, bad servants, because that servant says in his heart, my master's delaying his coming, he says, I'm going to give you a portion with the hypocrites. I'm going to give you a portion with people that said they knew me and don't know me. But then you also hear about 
outer darkness and a portion with unbelievers. There's both, just like there is now. And right now, we really want to be clear. That, I mean, we want to be resurrected. I don't want a thousand more years of in the flesh trying to work out salvation. Do you guys? I don't. I want to actually work it out now. Working it out means I get his heart, not just his facts. There are many people with his facts misrepresenting him. That's what Satan does. Satan takes his stuff, corrupts it, twists it. This is related to authority. Satan is not a creator. Satan is a counterfeiter, a co-opter, and a corrupter. You do not want to be a counterfeiter, a co-opter, or a corrupter. You want to be a revelatory person like God. You actually want to find out through the Holy Spirit what to say. A co-opter, co they wait for somebody else to say something, and then they pick it apart. That's not a faithful witness of Christ. You don't want to be a corrupter. You don't want to take things from God and then just put a little bit of humanity in it so it's a little more palatable. That's a corrupter, right? We don't want to be this way. We want to be faithful witnesses under authority, okay? So let's go to page three of the notes. There's more of those passages there. You can read those if you feel like it. And just check me on what I'm saying. But I think that you'll find the Bible bears this out really clearly that if you're a disciple of Jesus, you must be a witness. You must be a public witness. There's no other way about it. Okay, now, the reward of peacemaking. So really what a witness is is a peacemaker. That's what you're doing. When you testify of the truth to people that say they want the truth from the truth, you become, you just kind of stand in the middle from truth to people who want the truth. You're a peacemaker. That's a ministry of reconciliation is the way that Paul said it. We actually are called to reconcile people that want God to God, not people that don't want God. You don't throw your pearls before swine is the way Jesus said it in the Sermon on the Mount. God is not looking for us to go beat people over the head to get them saved. That's actually not saved. Salvation is voluntarily submitting to the leadership of Jesus by the Holy Spirit. And, and that happens in a voluntary way. And so when people start to say, I want truth, we give more truth as witnesses. That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's what Jesus does. He waits for us to say we want more. That's what makes prayer so powerful, asking God for more. Many, I lived many of my years in life stuck, just kind of thinking salvation was reading the Bible a little bit, going to church on Sunday, going to church on Wednesday, doing some kind of ministry to be helpful, never really growing in the revelatory knowledge of what's happening in God's throne room. That's not okay. But I wasn't asking for anything. I didn't even know you could. Nobody had ever told me you could ask God for more revelation of who he is. As soon as I started to do it, I started to get it. As soon as I started to get it, I started to tell other people that. I saw lots of people start to get revelatory knowledge of God because it was told to them that they could want it. But it's all a voluntary, it's because of love. God will not violate the boundary lines of your heart. He won't. Now, many people have said to me, I asked him. I told him I wanted more, and I didn't get anything. It's an until reality. It's an until. You keep asking until it works. It always works. Always. Okay, the reward of peacemaking. The path Jesus has laid out, it's difficult and narrow. There is no other way to get saved. There's only a difficult way in a narrow way. That's it. It's a narrow gate in a difficult way. There is no other salvation. There's not like you can go to the church that talks about prosperity and have that one work. You have to go to the one that talks about death to self. And if you go to a church that doesn't talk about death to self, then you need to be a faithful witness of death to self. That's required. Required. That's what the letters to the seven churches are really about. Okay, now, it's directly related, this difficult and narrow way that few will find. So if you're kind of waiting for the moment when everybody's going to get on board of this repentance, personal repentance and being a witness thing, you'll be waiting a long, long time, probably at least a thousand years. For real. There's no mass move of God about to happen the way that most people imagine the church waking up and doing the thing. There is going to be a great harvest in the world, but that harvest is very messy. According to the Bible, the harvest is very, very messy. And there's some people that come in in the harvest, and Jesus looks at me, he's like, where's your wedding clothes? And he says, get out of here. So if you're waiting for the big move of God when the church finally wakes up and we all do it together, you'll be waiting a long, long time. He's looking for us to be salt and light to the church that as many as would have a humble heart would get saved out of the church right now. That's the point of what's happening. He always takes a people from a people. He went to Israel, the people that should know God, and he found some that actually wanted to know God, and he took them out and called them a church. And then he took them to the world. 
And he's been searching the world for 2,000 years for people that say they want to know God. And he's going to reach into the church just like he reached into Israel. And he's going to take the people willing and make them a bride. But he never gave up on Israel. He still has a salvation plan for Israel. He will still have a salvation plan for the church called a thousand-year reign of Christ. And at the end of the thousand years, there's no devil for a thousand years, no demons. There's just renewal for a thousand years. And then he's going to sift that group of people called the world one last time. And it says a multitude, as many as number the grains of sand on the seashore are going to then rebel against him, even though he's got a throne set up in Jerusalem. The, the earth is his footstool. The heavens are his throne. They're going to see co co coordination between heaven and earth, angels going up and coming down. They're still going to rebel against him because the human heart is arrogant, hard and prideful and says it knows God when it does not. We have to repent and then we have to be witnesses. This is the only way of salvation. This is it. And this is what the pouring out of the spirit is for. This is what happened in Acts 2. This is why Jesus poured out his spirit. His friends, they spent 10 days repenting of their lack of knowledge of God. 10 days. And then he gave them something to explain and a bunch of people came to them. And they told them, you killed Jesus, repent. You think you know God, but you do not. That's why you don't understand what's happening here. This is going to happen in your day very soon. It's going to happen very, very soon. We want to be clear witnesses. The way that we become clear witnesses under the power of the Holy Spirit is we repent into that. We tell God, I am not a clear witness. I need your power. Then when he pours out his power, we get what we ask for. He pours out the bowl. Whatever's in the bowl that you put in it, that's what you get. Are we telling him? Or are we making excuses for why I don't need to be a witness? I'm just not that kind of person. I don't do this kind of stuff. I don't really like that thing. Or are we saying, Jesus, it's not okay. It's not okay that there's a platform that reaches billions and billions and billions. I mean, there's numerous platforms. Billions and billions of people. And I'm not praying into that at all that I would use it in power. It's mostly because we doubt. It's mostly because we think we're small and whatever we contribute isn't much. Okay, and I want, that's really a, another one of the points of this, these notes. Okay, I'll probably say that three times. Now, Isaiah 42 tells us Jesus didn't cry out in the street or cause his voice to be heard on his own behalf. So Isaiah 42 is talking about on his own behalf. Jesus never, he, he went like a lamb to the slaughter and didn't say a word. But he said many words on behalf of other people. Many words. He was a witness many times. Remember the lady that they caught in adultery? He said a lot of words about her. He'd cry, he actually cried out on her behalf. He, he talked those people that wanted to stone her into seeing their own sin. So if you're a witness, you're typically not a witness for yourself. You're a witness to Jesus' body, of Jesus' body. You actually stand with other people that are being mistreated. We talked about that a couple weeks, a couple messages ago. That's that whole point of Jesus separating sheep from goats. Remember that? And he's like, you... Visited me in prison. When I was sick, you came to see me. You gave me a drink of water. And a lot of people think that he's talking about like homeless and prison ministries, but he's not. He's talking about ministering to the body of Christ as being persecuted. That's what that, that Matthew 25 passage is about. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Okay, now, Isaiah 42. Jesus tells us Jesus didn't cry on the street or cause his voice to be heard on his own behalf. He did cry out and intervene on behalf of others, suffering injustice, false imprisonment, sickness, etc. Injustice comes from selfishness and the fear of man in God's people. All the injustice you see in the world, it's the church's fault. Why would I say that? That'd be such, that's such a dramatic statement. Why would I say that? Well, because we got the Holy Spirit. In, was that You're going to say that? Because we got the Holy Spirit. Sorry, Abigail, I asked her a question. I should have waited for the answer. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us. We have God inside of us. We're supposed to be the helpful answer to the injustice in the world. If we're not, we should be repenting. That's the point. We should actually be on a nonstop prayer meeting until God gives us what we need to be a conduit of his spirit into the earth because there's so much injustice. But we mostly find who we think is responsible for the injustice, and then we start pointing the finger and speaking wickedness while that place, whether it be homosexuals or the left or those who have abortions, they don't have the Holy Spirit. They don't have the answer to the injustice. They are victims. We have the power inside of us to answer the injustice. We should be doing it supernaturally. We should be prophesying, speaking words that heal and help. We should be like Jesus with the adulterous woman. We should be intercessors 
for justice with the Holy Spirit, not with crowds and mobs and sticks and breaking buildings. That's not intercession with the Holy Spirit. Intercession with the Holy Spirit is crying out, God, there should be power on the planet because you have a body on the planet. Your body is limp and practically dead, and we don't care. We just want you to come pick us up and take us to the wedding. I would never marry a woman like that, would you? That wouldn't even get dressed? Didn't care about her own wedding? Wanted all the wealth of her husband? Couldn't be bothered to do anything about it because she felt so insignificant, couldn't see the love that her groom had for her, the beauty that he had paid for for her, the wedding clothes that he had laid aside for her, the plans he had made for her. She did not see who she was because she had someone constantly talking in her ear. You're nothing. You're never going to be anything. It doesn't matter. You're weak. Did God really say? Did God really say? But what we do typically is we find people that are saying something about God, and we say, did God really say that? Did God really mean that? We take the place of the accuser. We're killing the body of Christ by not standing with Jesus prophetically to strengthen her. You see what I'm saying? And we use all that energy to rail on people not filled with the Holy Spirit, couldn't possibly have the answer to abortion, couldn't possibly have the answer to, to communism. There's no power in their soul. We keep saying, have power in your soul. Do something about your corruption. And we will suffer the exact same. We are forgiven as we forgive. We have power inside of us, latent power that we don't believe in. Sorry, I got excited there for a second. Now, injustice comes from selfishness and the fear of man and God's people. If we don't come out of the fear of man, we will be judged with the oppressors because of our silence. If you don't believe me, read Ezekiel 33, Revelation 3, when he talks to Thyatira, he says, you let that woman preach. You wouldn't say anything. I'm going to throw you into great tribulation. I'm going to kill your kids. And it's the church's fault. I, I say that without... Without apology, the injustice you see all around you, it is the church. So it's my fault. I haven't spent nearly enough time crying out on my floor, God, you got to do something. It is so tragic what's happening to young black men in this country. It's tragic. Are there criminals in the mix? Of course. But it's also tragic. It's awful. Isaiah 59, 13 and 19. In transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood, justice is turned back. Now, these, this is describing religious people. This isn't talking about ungodly sinners. These are people that thought they knew God. They actually thought they were the representatives of God. Justice is turned back and righteousness stands afar off. For truth is fallen in the street and equity cannot enter. So truth fails. And he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his, arm, his own arm brought salvation for him. His own righteousness, it sustained him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing. He will take vengeance. There are many people that will say, I prophesied in your name. I cast out demons in your name, and he will take vengeance on them. He said, he, the he who knew better and didn't do it is beaten with many stripes. Have you ever read that passage? Beaten. That's not like a figure of speech. He's going to take vengeance on lazy people that didn't care they were filled with the Holy Spirit, didn't care that there was a witness of truth in the earth because they bought a false gospel in a lie of the enemy that said, you can't do anything about it. That's how they worship the Antichrist. It's worthless to try and resist him. Who could make war with him? That's the words of worship listed in Revelation 13 of the Antichrist. It's apathy. Jesus is going to punish apathetic people that had power, Genesis 1 creator power inside of them. He's going to punish them. You didn't sign up for something neutral. You're not waiting to see what turns out from you. He expects something of us. He expects us to use our prayer life to increase in power, to be witnesses to the earth. He loves the earth. 
According to their deeds, accordingly, he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. The coastlands he will fully repay, so they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, now listen to this. This is heavy. Without the Holy Spirit, this is heavy. What I'm saying to you is very heavy without, hey, you know what? It, it's a prayer away. It's not your failure. It's your silence. It's a prayer away. There's, he's raising up a standard right now. I believe that's why I'm releasing this message. I released this message with so much hope. With so much hope that even just an inkling of, you know what, I'm just going to say the word of the Lord. I'm going to trust that he does something with that. He's going to raise up a banner when the Antichrist army comes flooding into the earth. It's happening right now. It's, you know, it's easy to make these dramatic Hollywood pictures in your mind of the Antichrist marching and the Antichrist spirit is all over the earth right now like if you're picturing hollywood you're picturing the wrong thing you have to see this in faith it's faith without faith it's impossible to please him he's coming like a thief you have to believe these things even though you can't see them the spirit of the lord will lift up a standard against him that standard is a banner on the mountain a flag on a mountain he's looking for you to do the sermon on the mount to be blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake reviled cast out counted all joy great is your reward your salt your light you don't hide light under a bushel you put it up on the lampstand so people can glorify the works of god that's what he's going to do the, the gospel it, the book of revelation is describing the fulfillment of the gospel it's not like some separate story from the gospel He's raising up people that do the Sermon on the Mount, that climb to the top of that mountain. We're preparing to be witnesses. This happens in repentance, not Dale Carnegie classes. You hear what I'm saying about being a witness, and you think, I just got to get better at giving speeches. You're, you're not understanding what I'm saying. I'm not talking about Dale Carnegie. I'm not talking about a smoother presentation. I'm talking about a, a broken, laid-down heart that's willing to be a fool, willing to try. That's what I'm talking about. Those are the best witnesses. This happens in repentance, not Dale Carnegie classes. We need a miracle. Once the Spirit was poured out, then the disciples became witnesses. Before that, Jesus didn't want them witnessing. He said, wait, don't go yet. Get in the upper room, pray. Wait for the promise of the Father. He is not really looking for you to be a witness without the Spirit. That's the point. So if you're like strategizing, how am I going to be a better witness on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, that's, you're missing the point entirely. Jesus. Fill me with your spirit. I want a prophetic spirit. I want to know what you're saying. I don't want to just take other, what other people are saying and take it apart because I don't think it's true. That's not a witness of Jesus. A witness of Jesus is filled with Holy Spirit power that says simple phrases that unlock hearts. That's the point. And mostly, no one has that on the earth. We're waiting for an outpouring of the spirit right now. The whole earth is waiting for an outpouring of the spirit right now. Jesus says the cost of not witnessing is everything. It's everything. Not witnessing, it'll cost you everything. Listen to this, Matthew 5, 9 to 19. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you, say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. You are saved. That's what that means. You are saved. If that's not happening, you are not. You are not. Hear me clearly. You are not. That doesn't mean you can't be. And I don't know what the measuring stick is. I don't know what the, the measuring stick of being a witness for Jesus was in 1800 versus 2020. But there is a generation where a bride becomes pure and spotless. That means much is given, much is required. So don't hear this and be like, I don't know if great grandpa was saved then because nobody ever killed him. That's not what that means. We're talking about you. We're talking about you living in a generation when you have access to Billions of people, you. You have access to billions of people. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for your great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. That's what that means. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put under a basket. But on a lampstand, it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men. He doesn't say, it'd be kind of nice if some of you let your light shine. Hey, you know, if you're a pastor, let your light shine. No, he says, let your light shine before all men. Be a witness. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Satan is attempting to stop witnesses of Jesus and his body with selfishness and fear. The judgments will increase this, not decrease it. 
The judgment's coming. They're not going to make it easier for you to speak. They're going to make it harder. The cost will be higher. The fear will be greater. You want to get in the muscle memory of it right now. Right now. Our willingness to simply pray that God would help us witness is what God wants. That's what he wants. He's looking for a prayer meeting. If we earnestly seek God, he rewards us. This is the definition of faith. You have to do it in faith. Without faith, you do not please him. This is the only thing that pleases him, and he answers it with power. Acts 4, 29 to 31. Now, this is after Peter and the other, Peter, John, and I think it was just Peter and John got arrested. The Jews told them, stop speaking about Jesus. And they said, is it better for us to listen to God or to man? We'd like to listen to you. That was their heart. They're like, we would like to listen to you, but we cannot. We, this thing we must do. We must witness of Jesus. And this is what they came back to the group of disciples. This is what they prayed. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant your servants that all, with all boldness we may speak your word. They were praying for boldness. That's what we should be praying for, boldness. By stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through your name, through the name of your holy servant Jesus. This is what they were praying. They were like, we just got checked. We just got in this meeting where they're threatening us. Yes, we stood, but then we realized we're not bold enough. We want boldness. We want the power to heal. We want to be witnesses of what you said in Mark, or at the end of Mark, the gospel of Mark. And you said, those who are Christians, they're going to pick up serpents and not get bitten and not get hurt. Drink poison and not be killed. Lay their hands on the sick and they'll get healed. We should be mourning this is not happening in every meeting, every time we go to work, every time we go to school. We should be crying out to God, God, this is not okay. The earth is breaking down and you're waiting on witnesses. Not just witnesses that have good Bible arguments. Went to a Dale Carnegie course. No, witnesses that are filled with power. Like the Bible talks about. Not like the American church talks about. Like the Bible talks about. This power getting poured out is not to have really great, fun, exciting church meetings and everybody will just see it's good entertainment and come. This is to endure being killed massively in the earth like happened in the Bible. We need something. Killing is coming very soon, very, very soon. You need power to be a witness that you don't quit when it happens. It's going to happen. And they, when they prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. They got what they wanted. They got what they asked for. It's really simple. They just prayed. Every time you see the pouring out of the Spirit, it's because somebody repented. Every time. It happened several times in the book of Acts. It wasn't just one Acts 2 thing. They kept getting a refill because they kept realizing their need. That's what the Holy Spirit should be doing to us. It shouldn't be showing us, hey, in confidence, just believe for the thing. It should be like, you really need something. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It's light. He's light. He shows us our need. So if you've been praying, Holy Spirit, touch me. Fill me with power. And you're like, I need him more than I thought. That's good. That's working. That's an answer to your prayer. Faith is required. Last item, 15 minutes. Social media is simply social interaction. We need to learn to see it this way. If you could picture yourself walking into a, a party or a room of people when you get on Facebook, you will act differently. We mostly act the way that we act on, on social media because we don't see it as people. We see it as some kind of weird software platform that's not real people we're interacting with. Without people, Facebook would be a blue screen with white boxes. That's it. That's all it would be. It wouldn't do anything. Nobody would be on it. It's people that you're seeing what they think and what they feel and what they believe that makes you mad, that annoys you, that excites you, that engages you. It's people. We need to see ourselves interacting with people. This is the way most people interact right now. You might not like it, but that's the way most people interact. You like it, though. I can tell. We don't we often don't do things on social media that we would do in person. There's a lot of things we don't do on social media that we would do in person. We often do things on social media that we would not do in person. And if we did it in person, our wife would slap us on the hand. Or a husband. Husband shouldn't slap. Wives can. Okay, now, just, I'm kidding. I'm totally joking. Um, these are some of the things that we do on social media that we would not do in person. Question correct people's beliefs with no conversational context. Just kind of landing on the thing. Hey, I think, oh. would you walk into a party, walk up to a conversation? People do this. We call them rude. And we all walk away from that person or kind of hope that we can get away from them. 
So if you're just flying into conversation, blah, de, blah, de, blah, and you wouldn't do that in real life, you're seeing Facebook wrong or Instagram wrong or whatever wrong. It's, a, it's interaction with people. This is common sense. We assume rhetorical questions or no questions are an invitation for our input. We generally don't do this face to face with people. But on Facebook, well, you asked it, you're going to get it. This is an attitude many people on Facebook have. Some of you have. It's a, if it's a rhetorical question, we're supposed to actually care enough about the person to care what kind of question are they asking. If they're not asking for our input, if you're in a party, typically don't start telling everybody how they should do stuff. If you do, you generally don't get invited back, right? Stock conversations. Just because people can't see you doesn't mean God can't. Could you imagine going to a party and acting like you do on Facebook? I'll just kind of watch you for a while. Hmm. Did you lose weight? Hmm. Oh, nice dress. Hmm. Would you want to hang out at a party with somebody like that? Just because people can't see you do it doesn't mean you don't do it. God sees it. We live before a holy God. We have, to, we have to recognize that we have self-control. We've got the Holy Spirit inside of us. We can actually be like, you know what? I'm just not going to stalk people. I'm just not going to do it. I'm living before a holy God. It actually will change the way I speak to people if I don't stalk them. You know, if you were lurking around stalking people at parties, you probably would, over time, develop a personality that was a little repulsive. So you'll do that in real life on Facebook. If you're a stalker, you're actually opening up something to a demon that violates people's privacy and the authenticity of relationships. You see what I'm saying? If God called you to witness the truth of his gospel at a party, would you, this is a quiz, walk around the room, rhetorical, walk around the room looking for people who are wrong about truth and subtly and not so subtly correct them? If Jesus was like, okay, I want you to go to this party, I want you to be a witness of me, would you walk around the room and be like, ah, eh, I don't think God said that. Eh. Yeah, it's kind of right, but you know, if you could see it this way. Eh. Yeah, maybe. That wouldn't be a witness of who Jesus was. No. Or would you look for opportunities to reveal what you know about God? Wait for somebody to ask you, hey, do you know about this depression thing? I'm just feeling this way. Do you have any input? What do you do? How do you, how do you say so peaceful? Like, why are you so joyful? Why are you always posting these things about God? Like, if you would wait for this to happen, it will happen. I think all of us probably have a testimony of it happening. Why, why is it that you carry yourself differently than everybody else? That's, that's waiting in the patience of Christ to be a witness. You see what I'm saying? And that's the way you do it at a party, because I know all of you. You're very polite people. It's just we get on Facebook or Instagram or these other media, and we feel like because we're hidden that no one sees, but God sees. God sees, and he cares very much about the way we carry our hearts, very much, because we're representing him whether we realize it or not. Now, every person on social media, they have like an ambassador of God booth, and I just picture like a trade show, even though this is a very weak example. I don't want to equate God to a, you know, a merchant, but this is a good example to kind of see what I'm talking about. Every person on social media has like this booth, ambassador of God booth, where people could stop and, and check out if they want to, Okay. But we don't typically sit in the booth. We don't typically put out there what we think and let people decide what they think about it. We typically go to where other people are getting some attention and we glom onto, for lack of a better word, whatever conversation is already happening. This is a very poor way to go about it. Jesus did not do this. Jesus actually waited. The witnesses of Jesus waited for people to come to them. Typically, there are a few times you read about in the Bible where the Holy Spirit tells somebody, Philip is a good example, and that example is in the, in the notes. But even Philip, when he went inside the, the Ethiopian eunuch's uh, wagon, the picture of wagon, he waited for an invitation to tell that guy what he thought. He asked a question. Hey, do you, do you understand what you're reading? Do you like that? And he's like, I, how could I possibly understand it? Come up here. Sit up here with me. Tell me about this. That's the kind of people we need to be. These are witnesses of Christ. Now, there's something warring against what I'm describing, and I want to talk about that for a second. We mostly operate in a doubting, 
rather than a revelatory capacity on social media. The doubt takes many forms. Sometimes we doubt that we have something helpful to say. Sometimes we doubt that anyone will pay attention to us. Sometimes we doubt what other people are saying. Doubt is not a fruit of the spirit. It's never helpful to the human soul to doubt. Even if somebody's wrong, it's not helpful to doubt them. It's helpful to reveal prophetically by the spirit truth, not to pick apart somebody else's truth. This is very important. This is the basis of most authority in our human interactions with each other is did God say is the question of doubt. God did say is the question of faith, is the statement of faith. This is what God says about it. This is what God's saying to me. Okay, now listen. This is mostly because we don't understand the way a witness works. We don't believe the way God builds the kingdom is effective, mostly. We kind of think something different than what the Bible says about the way God's kingdom is coming. Okay, now Matt, I'm going to read you a couple of parables. Matthew 13, 31 to 33. Another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. How big is a mustard seed? Somebody show me. Abigail, is it that big? They're tiny, 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 tiny. The kingdom of heaven is like this kind of seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed the rest, at least of all the seeds, but when it's grown, it's greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Another parable he spoke to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid three measures of meal till all was leavened. Is that a big, like, is the leaven compared to the, to the dough, is it a lot? It's a tiny amount. God is looking for your tiny statement, your tiny contribution. The thing that you say that God told you on your wall, your space, the space he gave to you. Many people think, well, no one will ever see it if I do that. Nobody will pay attention to it. That's not the point. The point is faithful witness, being faithful, being faithful to the spirit of God, to his authority. So a lot of these messages I've been talking about, you know, we have to stand with people who are being accused and attacked. And we might think, okay, well, then I got to get right on that post and I got to say all the things so that I'm a faithful witness to that person. No, that's the flesh talking. That means I look at that and I'm like, Jesus, what are you saying? Typically what he'll say is say something true. Put something true out there into the ether. John the Baptist is the perfect witness of Jesus. He's actually the one declared to be a witness of the light. Did John the Baptist, even though he was of the, the priestly clan, did he go to the temple and start telling everybody how they were wrong? No, he went to the river. A long, long journey from where everybody who cared about God was, and he started preaching to the river. And people came to him. Now, we might think, John, that's a terrible strategy. I would think that. You would probably think that. But God liked the faithfulness. God was looking for somebody that would say what God was saying no matter who listened. This is coming to you. Death for saying the truth. We judge how good we're doing on likes. That's satanic. He's not trying to get us to talk to people that will like what we say. He's trying to get us to talk about him in a way that will get us killed. He's going for the people that don't like what you're saying. They boo it. That's a faithful witness. John the Baptist out in the desert, baptizing, massive crowds start to come. People that, he's, that the Lord's actually trying to reach. He's, he's not trying to discount the Pharisees. Jesus ministered to the Pharisees over and over and over again. They came to John the Baptist. He said, you brood of vipers, who warned you to come out here? Who warned you to come and find out the truth? This is the way a witness works. Okay, now this is important. We should identify untruth, but not cast doubt. We have to know how to be helpful in witnessing. Casting doubt is always destructive to the soul. Doubt is not a fruit of the spirit. Faithfully releasing revelatory truth in the power of the Holy Spirit, it's a spiritual principle. If you sow, you will reap a harvest, guaranteed. I don't know how big that harvest will be. Lonnie, I do not know how many people will pay attention to what you say, wherever you say it. But if you sow the seed, it's guaranteed you will reap. Tom, I don't know how many people. It might be a hundredfold. But if you sow the seed, it's guaranteed you will reap. Bev, I don't know how many people you will actually reach if you say what God is saying. But I guarantee you, you will receive a harvest if you sow the seed. This has to happen. I'm, obviously, I'm just picking names up. This has to happen in faith. 
It has to happen in faith. Without, that, without faith, it's unpleasing to God. So if you're waiting for the moment, you're like, okay, I think this is the moment because everybody's kind of paying attention to me. I'm going to strike while the iron's hot. That's not faith. That's eyesight. That's flesh. Faith is, I'm doing it because it says I have to do it. And I offer weak yeses, and he's the one with all the power. He's going to touch it. He's going to give me a, a testimony of a harvest, some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. I don't know, but it's worth it to do it. It's worth it to just do it, to put it out there. This is actually way easier than what most people picture when they picture witnessing, when they're trying to assimilate this message to, okay, what do I do with Facebook? We typically make it way harder than it really is. It's really just saying something true in the, the place that belongs to you to say it. Just say the true thing and trust in faith that God takes those seeds and turns it into a big kingdom, which he will, guaranteed. He will guaranteed. Now, it says some sow, some water. You know, one plants and other waters. God makes it grow. God makes it grow. This isn't just true on social media. This is just true in life. You're at the bank, and you're like, Holy Spirit, what are you saying about the teller? The teller says, tell the teller that I love her. You know, God loves you. Great. I love God. Here's your money. You walk out. You don't know what that seed just did. I guarantee you it did something if God told you to do it, though. It seems weak. It's supposed to seem weak. That's, faith happens in the context of weakness. Without weakness, there's no faith. It must seem weak for it to be real. Faithfully releasing revelatory truth and the power of the Holy Spirit is always helpful to the soul. God's word never returns void. Isaiah 55, 10 to 11. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, I love this passage, and does, do not return there. He's like, I make this rain. The earth cannot live without rain. It's a billion little drops. You, you don't know the names of any of them. God does. He actually knows the perfect shape of every snowflake. He designs them. None of them repeat. He says, as it comes down, you don't know where it's going to go. But I make the whole earth live in this reality. We're part of this very same reality. It's in doubt, in hardness of heart, and trying to bring God down to the earth and have him explain to us how his things work, that we don't do anything. That we live with hard, stony hearts. We don't sow any seeds. We get bitter. We complain about everybody else and the seeds they're sowing. And God will damn people like that. For real. But if we're just willing to say, you know what, I don't, here comes a raindrop, God, I don't know what's going to happen with it. He's like, I water the whole earth. The whole earth lives. Without this, the earth will not live. It's by every word that God speaks that everything stays in motion. You're his body. You want to know why the earth is so messed up? There's so little speech. There's so little rain. God, send the rain. Send the latter rain. If you were around in the 70s, you're part of that, that movement, the charismatic movement, or even the latter rain. Movement. Send the rain. Send the rain. You are the rain. You're the rain. The Holy Spirit is the rain. The Holy Spirit comes through you. The kingdom is coming. Not in a way is to be seen, but through you. You're the rain. The earth is crying out for all creation is groaning that the sons of God would be revealed. Not that a big thundercloud would come and the spirit would pour out. We all have a little party in the rain. That the sons of God would be revealed. That's you. That's you. There's no other team coming. That's you. It happens in drops. It happens in weakness. It happens in faith. Still a couple more minutes. You are not small and insignificant. Oh, I should read the passage. But water the earth and make it bring forth bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. This will fill you up if you do what I'm saying. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but shall accomplish what I please. It's like, you don't know how it works. I'm God. You're not God. But you'll get filled up, you'll have bread to eat, and you'll cast the seed. You'll do what you're made to do. This is what you're made to do. You're made to reveal God. That's the whole point of your life. David reveals God when he paints. He's, he knows he's made for it. There's all kinds of ways we can reveal God. It doesn't get him out of speaking. Right? We're called to communicate God. That's the point. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. You are not small and insignificant if you're filled with the Spirit of God. If you will simply be faithful to speak the word of God, it will work in time. You are lawless if you glom onto other people's spheres of authority to make your points known, even godly truth. 
We're witnesses to falsehood if we operate outside of authority. If you witness lawlessly, no matter what words you say, you're a witness of lawlessness. The means don't, aren't justified by the ends. The means are the ends. Us willing to let the Holy Spirit be the power. That's the point. Watchmen, witnesses, and martyrs are synonymous in the Bible. Witnesses reveal Jesus, all of him, his body, that's the church, his mind, will, and emotions, that's his head. Remember, he said that you're the body, I'm the head. Witnesses reveal both and his spirit, the power on earth. They, they witness in power. We're not witnesses yet, not like we could be. We're witnesses in some measure, but not the fullness. That means that we, we spend time praying together that we will be witnesses. We don't make reasons why we don't need to be. Because Jesus is fully submitted to authority, we must be too. This means we don't co-opt other people's spheres of authority unless invited. Okay, look, listen to this, Luke 9, 1 to 6. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons to cure diseases. Now, every time you see Jesus sending people out as witnesses, he sends them equipped. If they're not equipped, he tells them to wait, get some power. If you feel unequipped, great, you're in a good place. Pray that you would be equipped. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, take nothing for the journey, neither staffs, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. I don't really want you wandering all around. I have prepared places to receive you. When you find one, stay there. Whatever house you enter, stay there, from there to, and from there depart. And whoever will not receive you, if they don't want you, leave. Don't stay in a place you're uninvited. That's lawless. When you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet as a testimony against them. So they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Okay, let's go to the last page of the notes. Right now, we're waiting for power to go. Until then, we operate where we are. That's Acts 2. That's what he called them to do in Acts 2. We operate primarily in our own sphere of influence, unless specifically sent somewhere else. For instance, on Facebook, we witness on our own page. We have full authority over our own page. You can do whatever you want on your page and not violate authority as it's seen from heaven. That's yours. That's your space given to you by Facebook or whoever. And that's yours to have authority over. Now, Facebook has authority over the platform, so they might say, we don't like what you're doing and take it off. But as long as you are doing what you feel the Lord is saying on your page, you're in full authority. When you start going on other people's stuff, you have to be very careful. doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it sometimes. There's sometimes God actually calls us to do stuff. But you want to make that the exception to the rule, not the rule. The rule is I operate in my sphere, what God's given to me. Well, that's so weak. How is that ever going to affect anybody? That's how people feel about teaching. Many people, when they're called to be teachers, they think they, they, they have to instantly be on a platform. Teachers don't find themselves instantly on platforms. They teach wherever they are. Teach your kids. Teach people that want to listen to you. Those are the best teachers. Have you noticed the teachers on platforms lately? What's happening? It's not good. The platform corrupts people. For real. Musicians, if you're an amazing musician in the sight of heaven, you do that in your bedroom mostly. You, heaven feels your worship. It's not, you don't do it because you're good at it because people give you an A+. Do you see what I'm saying? This is the same with Facebook or anything else. You're a witness to Jesus. You're just a witness. You cast the seed. You can't make it grow. But many people will get themselves into, I'm going to put a bunch of seeds here because I think if I put a bunch of seeds here, it's going to grow better here. That's the flesh. That's the flesh. You're trying to build a ministry. Don't do that. Don't ever try to build a ministry. If you build it, you got to defend it for the rest of your life. It'll wear you out. You'll end up quitting Jesus. Let Jesus grow something with your faithfulness. Just cast the seed on many waters. Now, Last thing I'm going to say, John the Baptist, the preeminent example of a witness, witnessed in the wilderness, people came to him. John 1, 6 to 8, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Stefan, uh, Samaritan, you guys want to come back up? Now, John, he's the preeminent witness in all of history. Greater man, man born of a woman? You will not find, except for those filled with the Spirit, right, in the kingdom. He's the Spirit of Elijah come, if you could have it, is what Jesus said. He was that Malachi promise that, he would, that God would send his Spirit to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, children to the fathers. He's the example of the two witnesses. That's the, 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 
the latter spirit of Elijah poured out to witnesses, ministering a testimony of what's true at the Temple Mount for 1260 days. We know almost nothing of what John preached, a couple paragraphs, but we know how he lived. He was a witness by what he did, where he did it, how he did it. That was his main witness. If you look, John's preaching is condensed to about four paragraphs in the Bible. But his life is exploding across all of the epistles. Those disciples, they followed John. He was a witness of the light. If you're filled with the light, you act like John the Baptist. You live different, yes. You don't take advantage of your heritage, your rights. He could have been in the temple. His dad was a priest. You faithfully cast seeds knowing God will make it grow. If you want that, stand with me. I'm just going to ask the Lord to give us some faith that you're not small. Your words are going to change the world. If they're the words of God. If they're the words of man, your words are breaking the world. And you need to repent. But if you got the word of God, and you're just willing to say it into the air, the Holy Spirit hears it and acts on it. That's how light was created before any man were alive. The word of God spoke and there was light. You're his body. You're the body of Jesus on the earth. If you speak it, it is becoming. Holy Spirit in this room, release faith. If you want faith, just let's raise our hands. Holy Spirit, release faith. In the name of Jesus, pour out faith that our conversations this week, they could change Kalamazoo. And maybe only you will hear it, but they could change Kalamazoo. Pour it into our hearts right now in Jesus' name. I bind doubt in this room. Okay, you put your hands down because I don't want to get tired. We, I bind doubt in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, you can keep your hands up if you want to. Holy Spirit, pour out your spirit. Pour out your spirit. We need you, Lord. We need you. This city, it needs you. It needs your words. We don't live by bread alone, but by every word God speaks. Would you release more of your words into the city by our faithfulness this week, God? More of your words into the earth. I just pray for the places all over the world that are paying attention to what my friends are saying right now. I thank you for India, God, that India needs the word of the Lord. Africa needs the word of the Lord. Europe needs the word of the Lord. Michigan needs the word of the Lord. Mexico, the word of the Lord, would you help us to be faithful to sow some seeds, God, that you would get a harvest, Jesus, that you would get a harvest, Lord. Gull Road needs the word of the Lord. Would you help us when we're at the store, say the word of the Lord, plant some seeds. Sprinkle Road, it needs the word of the Lord. God, I'm asking for Center Avenue. Center hearts on Center Avenue. Sprinkle your love on Sprinkle Road, God. Romance families on Romance Road. Love families on Lovers Lane. Lake Children's Arms on Lake Boulevard. Pour out streams of living water from Lake Street. Build your church on Church Street. Ransom families on Ransom Boulevard, God. Give us a, give us a living witness of who you are in the city in the name of Jesus. Amen.